But man, Father's Day, as I was praying this week uh, over this message, I truly believe the Holy Spirit uh, wanted me to speak to you guys about the Father's love. And the Heavenly Father wants you to know that He loves you, that He cares for you, that He desires to have a relationship with you, and, and that He wants to give you a revelation today of the Father's heart towards His children. He wants to reveal something to you. He wants to uncover something to you in an area that you may have some brokenness in. And, and you know, that, that he wants you to know that he loves you unconditionally. That, you know, we've had human, uh, you know, earthly fathers that may have put a condition on their love towards you, but our Heavenly Father doesn't do that. He's unconditional. There's nothing you could do that, that, would, that would thwart that love for Him. He loves you regardless of what you have done and who you, have are, and who you are. And I know Father's Day could be a very hard day for a lot of people simply because of our earthly fathers. Uh, you know, and, and it brings back memories and those things and those times. But I believe today God wants to break some things off of some people. I truly believe God wants to break some generational curses today, that he wants to break off some mindsets, that he wants to invade those areas in your life where you need healing from the brokenness to where you can truly live and embrace him as father, embrace God as father. Uh, there's got to be a revealing. And so we're going to talk about that today. So turn with me to Luke chapter 15. Luke 15, we're going to read verse 11 through 24. I think it's a very fitting portion of scripture for today. I'm reading out of the ESV version, and it says, And he said, There was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me my share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, come on, how many of you know we need to come to ourselves sometimes, that there's some prodigal sons and daughters out there that need to come to themselves he says, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And so he arose and came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him, and he felt compassion, and he ran, and he embraced, and he kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and before you I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe, and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand, and shoes on his feet, and bring the fatted calf, and kill it, and let us eat it and celebrate. For my son was dead, and is alive again. He was lost, and is found. And they began to celebrate. Come on, the title of this message, if you are taking notes, is Breaking Off the Orphan Spirit. Breaking Off the Orphan Spirit. Let's go ahead and pray. Father God, I just thank you so much for who you are. I thank you, God, for what you are about to do in and through this message. God, would you use me as your vessel? God, would you, would you speak through me to your people? Open up our eyes, our ears, and our heart, God, so that we can see you and know you, Lord. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Come on, and everybody said. Well, hey, in January of 2019, uh, a lot of you know that my dad passed away, and I got to tell you, man, it was one of the hardest things that I have ever been through in my entire life, especially because me and him, we didn't have a very good relationship. We didn't. Uh, unlike, you know, most, most fathers and, and, and their boys, we, we didn't have one, and, and I thank God that, you know, through that whole month where he was in the hospital and going through the sickness, that we literally mended our relationship while he was on his deathbed, and I thank God for that, uh, and if you've ever lost a parent, man, you know the trauma, you know the heartache that that causes, right, the emotions that you feel, the feelings, that, you know, the hurts of, man, I should have, and I would have, and I wish I could abs, right? All those stuff coming up. But man, when he passed away, it was like a piece of me died with him as well. I don't know. I, I can't explain it. It was, it was so crazy. It threw me for such a spiritual uh, spin where I felt that even my relationship with God almost kind of died 
as well, and I wasn't hearing from God. I felt so distant and, and, and you know, almost as if you know, my relationship was in, with, with him was non-existent, and I was so confused, and I remember I was sitting in a coffee shop in Fort Collins, and I'm, I'm crying, and I'm, I'm, just, I'm so just like, God, what, what's going on here? And you know, people are looking at me, and I'm, just, I'm, I'm ugly crying in the coffee shop. Anybody ever ugly crying here? You know, it's not very pretty. You're just very ugly when you ugly cry, okay? And, you know, it's grace for the people that are around you because they're like, golly, what is going on with this person? You know, but I was getting so frustrated, man, and I started to cry out, and I, I started to weep, and I, and I said, God, what do you want from me? I cried that out in the coffee shop, and he said these simple words in his, in, in his little whisper that he does. He says, Rick, I want you to be my son. And I got to tell you, man, it was almost like a spiritual dagger just went right through my heart. He filleted me open right there in the coffee shop, and instantly I knew what he was talking about. Uh, you see, up to that point, I realized that the man that I grew up trying to prove myself to, the man that I grew up trying to be somebody to and, and saying, well, you weren't there in my life. I don't need you. I can do this on my own. But when he was taken out of the way, all of a sudden, I didn't have nothing left to prove. There was nobody else that I could prove anything to. And that's what God was showing me this entire time I was serving God with this orphan spirit. Instead of serving him through a spirit of sonship. And that's where God wants us to be. See, God wants, to, wants us to be a place where we're not operating in this orphan spirit, but we're operating in this spirit of sonship. Come on, Romans 8, 15, verse 16 says, For you have not received the spirit of slavery, leading again to fear of God's judgment, but you received the spirit of adoptions as sons. You received the spirit of adoption as sons, the spirit producing sonship, by which we joyfully cry out, Abba, Father. Man, wasn't that song good? Oh, Josiah. Man, that was such a good song, so fitting for today. And I love this word sonship because in the Greek, it basically means adoption. It's the Greek word hyothesia, which means to formally and legally declare that someone who is not one's own child is henceforth treated and cared for as, as, another, as, as one own child, including complete rights of inheritance to adopt. Adoption, check this out. In adoption... All previous relationships are severed, and the new father exercises authority over the new son, and the new son enters into the privileges and responsibilities of the natural son. God wants to bless you with a spirit of sonship today. He wants to take you from an orphan spirit into this spirit of sonship where we are grafted into the heavenly family, where we can cry out, Abba, Father, and everything that the heavenly family has is now ours as a son or daughter of God. Come on, sonship, sonship. But one of our biggest problems that we face when it comes to embracing our adoption or our sonship to the Father is operating in this orphan spirit. It really is, and, and you know, it's, it's a spiritual condition by which some Christians profess outwardly to know God as Father, but experience an internal contradiction in that belief that has an external effect. Let me read that again. It is a spiritual condition in which some Christians profess outwardly to know God as Father, but experience an internal contradiction to that belief that has an external effect. In my relationship with my dad, I grew up trying to prove myself to him. I was an orphan. I, didn't, you know, I felt like I didn't have a dad, and so that transferred into my relationship with my heavenly father where I started to live out of performance to God that if I perform well, then he'll bless me. If I perform well, then he'll take me as his own. If I do these things, he will. But God is saying, no, you don't have to perform nothing. I love you unconditionally. I'm your heavenly father. I blessed you with a spirit of sonship. So who was the first orphan? Well, Lucifer was the first orphan. Who is Lucifer? Lucifer is the devil. That was his cherub name that was given to him in heaven. In Isaiah chapter 14, we see the fall of Lucifer. It says that in verse 13, you have said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will set on the mountain of the assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high 
God. That was Lucifer. Ezekiel 28, 17, your heart was filled with pride, Lucifer, because of all your beauty, your wisdom was corrupted by your love and splendor. So I threw you to the ground and exposed you to the curious gaze of kings. And so Lucifer being the first orphan, that's where that spirit was released on the planet. And since the fall of the garden in Eden in the book of Genesis chapter 3, this same spirit has been permeating the earth uh, since then. And once there was separation between God and man, between father and son, sin entered into the world. And once sin entered into the world, immediately feelings of abandonment came in. Feelings of loneliness, isolation, alienation, rejection, and fear, and all these things crept in. And in Genesis chapter 3, verse 10, even Adam says that he was afraid, and he hid himself from his father. What did God say? Who told you you were naked? You know, what, what, what has happened? He was afraid, right? And then in Genesis chapter 4, we see this fruit play out in a fit of jealousy with Cain killing Abel because his offering was rejected by the Father. And ever since, there's been this destructive spirit that's playing out from generation to generation. I mean, just think about the family unit nowadays. It's never been under attack more now than ever. And because of the breakup of the God-designed family unit, more and more people feel what? They feel alienated from God which contributes to children being raised without love, care, and security by their earthly fathers, which in turn has become a revolving door of fatherless homes in our generation. The orphan spirit, it's not that good. Check this out. Emotional, physical, and spiritual downfalls of the world today, I believe, can all be traced back to us feeling alienated from God, right, and from our biological fathers, you see, having a broken relationship with your earthly father, guess what? It contributes to the orphan spirit. It really does. It will open up that door. But I believe today God is going to break that free from some of you. I believe he's going to heal that heart. He's going to heal that broken heart. And you're going to leave here. You're going to feel so different. You're going to feel so free from the weight that you've been carrying. Uh, and so, you know, this orphan spirit contributes to that, especially if you grew up without a father. Maybe he was an abusive father or a father figure. Maybe he was absent in the home or, or maybe he, you know, he was there but he was never present. You know, there's a difference between being there and present. You know, uh, you know I, I thank God for my dad. He was such a hard worker and I want to honor him for that. Don't think for a, a second that I'm dishonoring my own father because I love that man with all my heart. And he did the best that he could do with what he has. And so I honor him for that. He was such a hard worker, but he wasn't present. He, wasn't, he was never there, uh, you know, and, and that contributed to this orphan spirit. It's called the father wound, which stems from a place of father absenteeism, both emotionally and physically. And with your father, maybe he was a very critical man, a very angry man. Maybe he was negative. Maybe he was abusive. Orphan men have a hard time connecting to their spouses, connecting to their children, connecting to people in authority, in work, and at church. They are rebellious, angry, and have a hard time loving and accepting themselves. And unfortunately, this orphan spirit has been permeating the church for a very, very long time. Where we know God, man, we, yes, man, we can relate to Jesus. Oh, I love Jesus, man. We can relate to the Holy Spirit. But when it comes to Father God, let me ask you this question. How do you relate to him? Do you view him through the lens of your own earthly father? Or maybe the lack thereof? Or, or, or do you have a, 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 man, a, a just brilliant, awesome relationship with the Father? Because the Father desires that from you. He really does. He really does. And so this orphan spirit, often living under this spirit, it can go undetected in, in, in someone's life. It really can. And most people don't even know that they're operating under it. And again, I'm not saying that you're possessed by this orphan spirit and you're walking around, oh, i, I got to get deliverance from this thing. No. You can operate underneath that thing with the mindset of an orphan. But God wants to change that identity. You see, people who operate under this spirit, they operate out of insecurity they operate out of jealousy. They're jealous of, the other, of successes of others around them. They're happy when they fall because it makes them feel good about themselves. They're constantly striving, trying to earn their father's love and approval through performance accomplishments in ministry and in business and in the home. 
They're constantly, strive, uh, they're, they're constantly trying to push down their sense of alienation, loneliness, and lack of self-worth through constantly working, going from one relationship to the next, physical gratification, and living a life of narcissism and self-indulgence. They have issues with uncontrollable anger, fits of rage, and other forms of manipulation because they feel they must control others and their circumstances to fulfill their goals. They're always trying to outdo others in church and family, in business and denomination because they receive their identity from being better than everyone else. Else, They have a lack of self-esteem and hard time loving and accepting themselves. They can never have enough career success, material possessions, pleasure, or illicit relationships to satisfy the hole in their heart related to their identity. You guys doing okay out there? <laughs> I know, man. We just hit like six gear. We're just going a million miles an hour here. But, man, thank God for Jesus Christ. Thank God that he had a plan from the foundations of the world to, con to, 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 man, to combat this thing. Man, he saw, it was just like the prodigal father in the story, man. He saw you a long way off, and he knew, man, and he felt compassion. He said, man, we're going to deal with this thing, and I'm going to fill that void in their heart that they need so desperately. And so how do we get free from this thing? Man, we're making good time. I should probably slow down here. <laughs> Some more dad jokes. Should we do that real quick? So point number one, in order to break free from this spirit, you have to have a revelation of the he heavenly Father's love for you. There has to be a revelation. There has to be a revealing that God has to reveal something inside of your heart that he loves you. Come on, 1 John 3, 1 says, what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God? And so are we, that we should be called sons and daughters of God, that you have a heavenly Father up in heaven that calls you son, and he calls you daughter. He calls you by name. In fact, he knows the number of hairs that are on your head. He knows the word that is coming out of your mouth before you even speak it. When you were in your mother's womb, he was forming you and shaping you. The, the, he, was, he, was, he was laying out the foundation of your life, and he was writing the things in his book about your life. It says that he is intimately acquainted with all of your ways you have a heavenly father behold what manner of love is this that we should be called children of God, God thank God I mean the story in the about the prodigal son that we just read it's no more a story about a lost son than it is about a father's love in fact this is a parable of our Heavenly Father's love towards His children. And see, if you're doubting the Father's love for you today, I want to tell you to look no further than the cross of Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave. He gave what? He gave the best gift that he could give. His one and only son. His one and only son. Right? That whosoever believes in him will what? Will not perish but have everlasting life. Come on, John 1, 12 says, But as many as received him, as received who? Received Jesus. To them he gave the right to become children of God. Even those who believe in his name. Jesus said in John 14, 7, If you had known me, you have seen my Father also. And from now on, you do know him and have seen him. If you want to know the Father, guess what? You need to know Jesus. But see, Jesus takes it a step further, and he, says, and he says, I will give you another helper, the Spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit, who will bless us forever. So if you want to know Jesus, guess what? You need to know the Holy Spirit. It is by the Holy Spirit that we can have this revelation of the Father's love for his children. Come on, Romans 8, 16, again says, The Spirit bears witness with our spirits that we are what? That we are children of God. The Holy Spirit on the inside of you, man, bears witness with your spirit that, man, I am a son. I am a daughter. I am accepted, man. I don't have to prove myself to nobody. I don't have to prove myself to anyone. I am loved just the way I am, and the Father wants you to know that this morning, that you are loved. Come on, it's by the Holy Spirit that he reveals Jesus to us, that reveals the Father. You have to have a revelation that the Father in heaven loves his children. He loves you unconditionally. Notice in the prodigal son's story, the father never once cursed his son. He never disowned him. He never condemned him. He never put a condition on him. But he loved him and he accepted him just as he was. In fact, in verse 20, it says, man, he had compassion on him. 
that he's seen him, and it was almost prophetic, right? And who knows if he was looking and seeing the prodigal son coming. I think it was kind of prophetic for him to say, man, I know my son's coming back one day. I can see him a far way off. I can see him running towards me on that day. And when he comes, man, I'm going to meet him with a robe. I'm going to meet him with a ring, and I'm going to kill the best fatted cat because he is going to come home. Come on, today, God wants you to know that he loves you. Just like that prodigal son story, man, just like the father in that story, man, he sees you a long way off, and he is ready and willing, and he is ready to meet you with that robe. But can I just, to say, can I just say today that you are valued by your heavenly father, that his desires for you are good and not evil, that his desires for you are to give you a hope, to give you a future, to set your feet upon a rock, a solid foundation, to break you free from that orphan spirit. Can I just say that Jesus came to restore those broken relationships in your life? If you had a broken relationship with your dad, he came to restore that, man. He came to, he came to, he came to, to, to take that thing, man, and to, to break it off of you. Because that's the number, one, that, the number one thing that holds us back from embracing him as father. It's our relationships with our earthly fathers. It is. It really is. Because that's our view of what a father is, right? Whether he was a good father or maybe he was a, wasn't a good father. That gave you a heavenly perspective of what your heavenly father is. But you don't have to have a not-so-good father to have an orphan spirit. Maybe your home was based out of performance. Maybe your home was based out of you better do what I tell you to do or you are going to get a whooping. You know, those type of things, right? And so I believe God wants to bring uh, freedom in that broken relationship. And he wants to heal that relationship with your, heavenly, or with your earthly father. And so the first step in doing that is what? Inviting Jesus into that mess. So if you have a broken relationship with your dad or maybe the lack thereof, guess what? It's not gonna be healed unless you invite Jesus into that thing. Unless you get down on your hands and knees and you say, God, I need you to come and heal this thing. And guess what? He's gonna come in and he's gonna bring up some things that you're not gonna be very happy that are gonna be brought up. But the pain, I mean, the, the, you, there's gonna be some pain going through this process. But man, the first step starts with inviting Jesus into that and saying, God, help me to forgive. Help me to forgive. Come on, some of you today need to forgive your earthly fathers. You need to. Maybe that relationship can't be restored. Maybe it can't, but forgiveness is causing damage in your heart, and you'll never see the Heavenly Father as your Heavenly Father unless you forgive your earthly fathers. Check this out. There's so many negative consequences to not forgiving people. I did some research. I love doing research. And so it's scientifically documented that studies show that you, it, uh, unforgiveness can lead to emotional pain. It can lead to anger. It can, really, it can lead to hate, hurt, resentment, bitterness, and so on. And the consequences can create health effects and health issues. And it can, it, it can stop you from experiencing freedom that God wants you to experience. It can kill you early. You can die early from unforgiveness. But studies have also found that the act of forgiveness can reap huge rewards for your health. It can lower the risk of heart attack. It can improve cholesterol levels and sleep. It can reduce pain, blood pressure, levels of anxiety, depression, and stress. And research points to an increase in forgiveness, in, in the forgiveness health connection as you age. You see, these, these, these thoughts of these unforgiveness and bitterness we have, maybe towards our earthly fathers or fatherly figure, they're creating health issues in our life. But not only that, they're stopping us from seeing our Heavenly Father for who, who He truly is. You gotta forgive. There's gotta be forgiveness. You gotta allow the Holy Spirit to come in in Jesus and say, God, I want you to just rip the Band-Aid off. Will you rip that tourniquet off, Lord? I know it's gonna hurt, just like you did me in that coffee shop. I'm telling you, man, it was like, it was like a slice and dagger just went right through my body. But you know what? I'm so grateful that he did that because it, it exposed this orphan spirit that I was operating on, man, and it just brought me into this fullness that I have that I just, I love and I view and I embrace him as father. And he wants that for you too. Come on. So point number two, once we have the revelation of the Father's love, we have to begin to walk in the identity of a son or daughter. So once we have that revelation, once the curtains have been pulled back and we allow Jesus to come in and, and heal those broken relationships and we allow the Holy Spirit to give us a heavenly perspective of our heavenly Father, we now need to start to operate, walk in the identity of a son or daughter. And that's what God wants you to know. He wants you to know that you are a son. There is an identity that you to walk in. And, 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 and in that identity, come on, he doesn't say I'm the king of slaves. 
He doesn't say, I'm the king of servants. He doesn't say, I'm the king of orphans. What does he say? He says, I'm the king of kings. I am the king of kings, and I am the Lord of lords. And in, in the book of Peter, it says that we are a nation of what? Kings and priests. So he is a king of kings. We are royalty. We need to start walking and acting and having our head up like we are royalty because we are from a heavenly kingdom. That is who we are. That is our identity. He is not the king of slaves or the king of servants or the king of bond servants. So notice in the story that the status of the son never changed in the story, in the heart of his father. And even though he was alienated from home, he was isolated in the eyes of, uh, you know, of the father, he was still a son. Look at verse 19. This is the son saying this. He says, I am no longer worthy to be called your son, Treat me as one of your hired servants. This is him saying in his mind, this is what I'm going to tell my father. And then so he arose and came to his father. Again, but while he was a long way off, the father saw him and felt compassion on him. And he ran and he embraced him and he kissed him. Look at verse 21. And the son said to him, his father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. So the son already made it up in his mind that he was not even worthy to be called a son. That I'm going to go back home and I'm going to just be like a hired servant that my father. And maybe, just maybe, if I perform like a servant, then he'll accept me back into the home. But notice in verse 22 that the father doesn't even acknowledge what the son just said. There is no acknowledgement. It was almost like a foreign language to the father. the father. The son is saying, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And it went right over the father's head because that's not even in the index of what the father is thinking. No, you are still my son. I don't care what you have done. I don't care where you have been. You are still my son. It was foreign to him. He couldn't even hear it. Thank you, mama. <laughs> Why? Because no matter what the son did, it did not change his identity of who he was. He was still a son. And he was still his father. Galatians 4, 7 says, For you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if you are a son, guess what? Then you are an heir through God. Romans 8, 15, You did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. You see, a son has different rights than that of an orphan. A son is an heir to all that the father owns. An orphan does not own anything. A slave does not own anything. A servant of the house does not own anything. You see, an orphan serves his father to gain favor from a perspective of if I perform well, then I have a place. And if I don't, I will be punished. But a son serves the father out of a sense of divine acceptance and favor and serves the house out of a sense of worship because they believe they belong. you got to believe you belong, church, that you are from heavenly blood, that you are from heavenly perspective. God calls you his sons and his daughters. We've been born into royalty, grafted into, adopted into this heavenly family. And so with that comes a stigma of walking like a son or daughter of God. If I can have the keys out, that would be awesome. Actually, if I can have the full band out, that would be great. You guys can hear me out there. Oh, they're moving. I got movement, everyone. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so again, the son serves the father out of a sense of divine acceptance and favor. Your heavenly father accepts you just as you are. And he wants relationship with you. He wants to change. He wants to mold. He wants to shape you into the son or daughter that you deserve to be. Did you know that you deserve a heavenly identity? You really do. You deserve better than what you have right now. And God wants to give it to you because you belong to the heavenly family. You belong to royalty. That's your identity. That's who you are. Forgive what your dad did. That's not what the father's love is for you. His is completely different. And so in Exodus chapter 21, there's this interesting law for Hebrew slaves. Now, I want you to get give the 18th and 19th century definition of slave out of your mind because we have a different perspective of what slaves are in our culture than they did back then uh, because of what happened, you know, and, and, and again, God forbid that that happened. But slavery was really common back in the Old Testament days. 
And in fact, even when a conquering king would go to conquer another city, they would take the people of that city, uh, right, as slaves in their country. And that's the kind of slavery we're used to. But slavery was also used to pay back a debt that you didn't owe. Uh, maybe you couldn't, maybe you hit somebody's, I don't know, ox and killed it, right? And you had to pay back whatever, uh, you know, the amount of that ox was. Well, you could become their slave until you pay that back. But the interesting law in this, in, this, in this chapter is after six years, right, the seventh year, the Jubilee year, you had to let your slave go. You just had to. You couldn't let them work past the seven years. But if the slave or the servant of the house said, you know what? I don't own anything. I don't have family and friends. I love working for my master. I want to work for you forever. Well, then that master of that servant can take the servant to the magistrate, to the judge, and say, hey, uh, he wants, they they want to be a part of me forever. Okay, great. It's done in the law. Okay, now you got to go back to your house, and you get in, you get a, an interesting, you get a, an awl, right, which is a giant nail, and you stuck it through the earlobe of that servant. And what that did was it signified that that servant is no longer a servant or a slave. It is a bond servant or a bond slave. That they bound themselves to you for life. That they chose to serve you for life. But isn't it interesting that not even a bond slave has the same inheritance as a son does? And the problem is we have a lot of Christians running around the church that are bond servants in the house. And they're operating from the spirit of a bond servant or a bond slave, but they never came into the spirit of sonship. That we have tied ourselves together with Christ and we say, Lord, I want to serve you with my whole life and my whole heart, but we do it from a spirit of a slave or a servant and not that of a son or a daughter. There's a huge difference because not even a bond servant gets the heirs to the kingdom. Not even a bond servant gets the keys. They're still a bond servant. They're going to grow as a bond servant. They're going to die as a bond servant. But the inheritance gets transferred to the son or daughter of God. That you and I have an inheritance in heaven. We have a promise from our father Abraham that has been passed down from generation to generation. And because you have been grafted into the heavenly family, because you've been grafted into, guess what? You are now an heir to the kingdom of heaven. You're a son and you're a daughter of the Most High God. The late great theologian John Wesley, you guys know John Wesley. He was an honor graduate at the Oxford University. He was an ordained clergyman in the Church of England. He was orthodox in his theology. He was active in practical good works, regularly visiting inmates in prisons and workhouses. He distributed food and clothing to the slum children and the orphans. He studied the Bible diligently, attended numerous services during the week. He generously gave offerings to the church and alms to the poor. He prayed and fasted and lived an exemplary moral life. He even spent several years as a missionary in America to the American Indians in the British colony of Georgia. But Upon his return from England, he confessed this in his journal. He said, I who went to America to convert others, but was never myself converted to God. Later reflecting on his pre-conversion condition, he said this. He said, I even then had the faith of a servant, though not that of a son. He did all these things before he was even a son. He did him as a servant, and he had, a, he, had a, he had something happen to him when he was in Aldersgate Street in, in the society where he heard the true gospel, and he said, God, I have been serving you from the heart of a servant. I never has, I, I, I wasn't serving you from a heart of a son. And so he gave his life to Christ there. And it completely changed the face of, of Christianity from that one point. He's the founder of Methodism. Well, it's not today what it was back then. Not by any means. It just proves a point that, man, as children of God, yes, we should be servants of the house. Yes, should we, we should serve Christ, but not from the spirit of a servant, but from the spirit of sonship. Not as bond servants, although good, making that decision to choose and serve your Lord for the rest of your life, but through the heart of a son or a daughter with the ownership Pastor Aaron Aaron talked about a couple weeks ago. And this is my house. I'm an heir to this kingdom. And everywhere my feet treads, boy, that's holy ground. Because I bring the keys of heaven with me. 
I know my daddy and he knows me. Come on, everything that I do, he tells me to do. So come on, today, I just really sense the Holy Spirit wants to break some stuff off some people. Can we just all stand to our feet? Come on, if you had a not so good relationship with your earthly father, maybe he's passed away, maybe he's done some bad things in your life. Come on, right now, let's just all lift up our hands towards heaven. Come on, Jesus, just like you did for me in that coffee shop, Father God. Just like you did for me in that coffee shop, Lord. You see the hands lifted high. You see the hearts that are in this room, Lord. God, I pray right now, God, that you would break off, Lord. Anything that is not of you, Lord, that you would fill that void, God, in the men and women's hearts, Lord, that may have been created by their earthly father. Lord, that forgiveness, God, would come in the name of the Lord Jesus, God. You break it off, Father. Thank you, Lord. God, and that you would reveal right now your heart for your people, the heart for your sons and daughters, Lord, that identity right now is restored back to your sons and daughters in Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' mighty name. And God, we pray right now, Lord, for those prodigal sons and daughters. Come on, if you have a prodigal son or daughter, we're gonna pray them through right now. God, just like you've seen the, the, the prodigal son a far way off, Lord, we see those prodigal sons and daughters a far way off, and we see that they are coming home in Jesus' mighty name. We see, God, that they are coming home in the mighty name of Jesus, God. We see, Lord, that they are on their way back, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Can we do Abba just real quick? Come on, church. Now it's time to worship your Father as true sons and daughters of God. Come on, Jesus. give you an invitation this morning that if you're standing there and you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior or maybe you've walked away maybe you're coming back and you're saying you know Pastor Rick I've I've, I've been living in this orphan spirit I want to rededicate my life back to Jesus this moment is for you 
The Bible says that if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. There has to be repentance to fill your heart. Repentance is simply to turn away from the life you are living and turn towards faith in Jesus Christ. And the Bible says if you do that, you will be saved. You'll be grafted into the heavenly family just like I talked about. You'll become a son or daughter of God and on, on this journey of life and allowing him to change and transform you into the image of his son. And so if that's you out there, can you just give me a wave right now? Just give me a wave. Keep your hand up so I can see those online. Please comment. You say, yes, Pastor Rick, that's me. I want to give my life to Jesus right now in this moment. Come on, a few more seconds as I look to the left and to the right, to the front or back. Well, God, we thank you, Lord, for this morning. I thank you, Heavenly Father, our Father, God, that you love us unconditionally, Lord. And we just say happy Father's Day to the Heavenly Father, to the one true Father. We say happy Father's Day, God. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Come on, and everybody said, amen. Come on.